please hit like, share, and subscribe. Now enjoy the Practical Guitarist Podcast. Good evening, set an email. Good evening, Dan. I'm just interrupting you in the middle of taking the day off, sending emails. Yeah, I, I just, I feel like taking the day off tomorrow, and <laughs> I can understand. I have been extremely stressed out for the last, uh, the last ten days, really. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just not feeling it for tomorrow. I, I went to the gym today, which is good. Don't get me wrong. And I went, uh, I went for a three mile walk, and. Uh, so I'm feeling good, and I don't feel like working. I got to be totally honest. I don't well, feel like working. Because working for me, see what I'm doing right now? This is as extraneous as it gets. Yeah, you just sit Mentally, there. Mentally. You just sit there, right. And yeah, you, physically, yeah. this is it. All right. So I've been stressed out, but I've been stressed out over the tube crisis, which is going to be the subject of tonight's episode. Yet again, um, we'll release this one before we get the – Dylan Talks Tone episode out. I'm going to probably just push this one out as fast as yeah, I can because yeah. it's still relevant. So yeah. there's been some stuff. Some, th- some things have happened. Um, been some stuff, but, seen some things. But before we get there, <laughs> we're going to talk about our what's news because we always do this. Um, so I have a what's new from last week. I bought a uh, an Amp 1. Oh, yeah, yeah, you did. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm acting like I hadn't heard about it. <laughs> no, no, of course you had. <laughs> I got the yeah. uh, I got the Mercury edition. Um, yep. Yep. I'm not 100 percent on keeping it at this point. I really? really like it, but the question is, would I like the Iridium more? And the difference in price is like 100 bucks, and I, I'd have mm-hmm. to wait on the Iridium because yep. it's not in stock anywhere right now. But I kind of feel like I kind of feel like this might be the tool for me. Um the the mercury edition so i'm not really sure yet um just to give you a little bit of background so like i've been playing it with my s500 almost exclusively strat tones i mean it's got them in in spades i mean it'll do hendrix it'll do the the robin trower thing it'll do uh jason me 100 type sounds which i never really was like big on but now i can like kind of get behind it um this is actually probably more manageable than an actual right. JCM 800 in a lot of ways. And I know everybody's like, that's a solid state amp with a tube in it. Listen, let me tell you something. If I put a blindfold on your ass, you couldn't tell the difference. You know why? Because I can't tell the difference. And, and it's just wild to me that this thing is this good and it doesn't use tubes, which is totally relevant to tonight's topic. And yes, it's absolutely why I bought one. Um, yep. Because I was like, I did this whole thing last week, and I know I mentioned on the show, I was looking at the Axe or the Axe Effects, uh, the Axe Effects 3, and I was like, I was on the fence. I could have, I could have bought one. I have enough money. Right. Like, it would have been no big deal for me to have gone and done it. But I kind of like, I didn't want to drain my bank account to go do it. Wouldn't have been draining it, but it would have drained my gear fund completely, like to nothing. And I need some of that money to complete this record and stuff. So I was like, it, th- there are drawbacks to the digital modeler and you're using yeah. a Kemper. So you have one of the yep. ones that has the fewest drawbacks because you have physical knobs for damn near everything. Um, yeah. yeah. The only thing you can't tweak is like the really finite parameters for re- reverb and delay, but like bass, middle treble right there on the front presence on the front. You've got, you know, it's, it's, it's genius. I don't understand why, why these guys can't get behind this thing. The problem with the Frankel is, you get five assignable knobs. I believe it's five. Five assignable knobs on it. But it's like, okay, every amp model in the damn thing has like 40 parameters. I mean, you can literally pick the, the, the type of 12AX7 in the front. Like, do you yeah, want an ECC3 yeah. or 83? Do you want uh, a 12AT7? Do you want a, tw- you know, <laughs> it's, you it's, know. it just gets nuts. <laughs> um, yep. And, and, you know, what do you want your plate voltage bias adjusted to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you want 62 volts I or 70 volts? I'm not an Amtec. I, I, I don't know that question. I mean, 
I feel like I'm crossing the bridge of death here. Mm-hmm. Um, or the bridge of hilarity. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. there are people, uh, I mean, this, this goes to right back to the beginning of the, our channel. And the fact that you do more recording and I do more live playing. Matter of fact, I do almost no recording. I need to do more, and I know that. But I have a total. Um, I have a totally different attitude about it now. But go ahead. Yeah, and, and because in recordings, I mean, I, I was just watching Beato take apart um, a couple of Boston albums, and I enjoy those things. And one of the things that he pointed out, which I don't really think about till you really sit down and listen to it, you know, you just wow, this sounds better. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not really why that that doesn't come into mind until somebody goes, here's probably why it sounded better. And he plays it back to back, a same riff that that uh, it just so happens Joe's, uh Schultz used a similar riff in two albums. And it's like, yeah, it did sound better and, and bigger on that first album. And it's funny because <laughs> most bands are going to get bigger, right, in the later albums. But my point here is this. Those little things are stuff you look for. You're like... You're you're pulling the fine hairs. I'm thinking of when Harry Potter is reaching into that thing and he's pulling out the you know memories. What? It, it's it's almost not true though. Like I I actually don't look for that stuff anymore. You know what I want? I want an amp that just sounds freaking good. Like I don't want to have to dick with it a lot. I, th- yeah. It just drives me nuts to have something like an Axe FX where there's a million parameters. I I just give me the good ones. Like stop right. it. I don't need to pick my tube type in a high gain amplifier for the first stage what right i mean it doesn't make sense what? to you me you don't you don't change the cathode rate or i mean the uh, uh, cathode voltage to yeah. 64 volts versus yeah. 64 and a half yeah right i mean it's, i can't uh, believe you don't do that you are such a loser do you know what <laughs> jim do you know what i actually want like this is why the amp point is perfect right it's four amp models that's all it is yeah. right so you got a clean <laughs> channel you got a plexi yeah. channel you got a JCM 800 channel and you have a high gain channel, which I don't know what right. that's based on, but it's a totally different thing. And um, all of them sound good. The EQ controls yep. are simple and easy to use. It's not like they're interactive or any crazy horse shit like that where you have to learn, like, I got to keep the bass at four if I want to have the treble up above seven. Like, you don't have yep. to learn any yep. of that kind of garbage. And it just works. And it's loud. Yep. Like, yeah. What, yeah. what more could that's- you ask for? I mean, <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. And you know what I like about the, the, um, I loved the amp one. And to be honest with you, I've been thinking about getting another one. I doesn't so, surprise me. And don't be surprised if I get another one. It's a I mean, super easy tool is, to use. It's a great amp. And I'd almost rather have one over my twin. And that's the truth. Cause the amp one has so many things it does and it's so light. I mean, it, you got it, it and you know, uh, it's almost like, did I just buy a Lego kit? I mean, it's yeah, like, so well, it's a Swiss, light. it's a Swiss army knife though. Like, yeah, that's the one thing that I took away from, from playing around with it over the, the cause I've had it since um, Friday and we're recording yep. the show on Sunday. Um, the, the, the Swiss army knife nature of it. I don't yep. think I was able to wrap my head around until I had it. Like there's a low gain mode on it. There's yep. um, the half power mode, and that's not even the power soak. So there's also a power soak, which allows you to like run this thing at like milliwatts to yeah. to you know like two watts that's at crazy, home, right? Which which that's something I want to get into, but I got to get the MIDI cable, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, that's that's a commitment. If I buy the MIDI cable, then I'm already I'm keeping the unit because the MIDI cable is fifty bucks, yeah. um, and. Uh, so I have to make that determination before I do it, which is kind of crappy because like now I'm like not really sure that I'm going to use these features, but um, yep. I'm I'm probably just going to pony up. I mean, for 50 bucks, I could sell it used if I decide to send it back and get, get my money back. Exactly. And but, I recommend um, the other thing I recommend is if you decide to keep it, get the uh, yeah. get the um, pedal board mounting kit. Because yeah, I was going to get that. Oh, so right. When you step on it, you can kick it halfway across a room. Well, I mean, I could, I could dual lock it to it, but here's the thing that they don't tell you about the M1. The back of it's plastic. It's, it's right. really high-grade plastic. It's like it's like the kind of stuff they use to make firearms, but it's, right, right. But it's still plastic, right? right? And you could drop it, and you could break the back of it. You're better off That's to right. use the magnets, the neodymium magnets they sell with it, and just yep. secure it to your pedal board. Um, yep. The thing is, I the, this is one of the things I don't like, is that you have to have a pedal board to affix it to permanently, and it has to kind stay of, yeah. in that in that spot yeah. because it's. Um, I think 
I think the guy Chad Boston, he makes a lot of stuff for <laughs> these kinds of things. He makes stuff for that. And if he I doesn't, might re- I might reach he out to will. him. I mean, Chad's a really cool guy. And, and I asked him, I reached out to him this week. Yeah, I, I know actually, people uh, have got I stuff. Had, yeah, I already got an email back because I want to get something for my um, Kemper. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you're you're seeing what I like about the Kemper. You're seeing in the in the Amp One and what I liked about the Amp One. It's easy. Right? Yeah, That's exactly what I was going to say. I have – the beauty of it is we had Tone Junkie on. I, I want to get him back on. Um, he, 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 is, he changed he, your life, didn't he? Yeah. I <laughs> bought his, pack, his everything pack. And I have every amp I ever want. And to be honest with you, I don't need. Like three um, quarter of them. Of them. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, I can. Okay. I like these right here. And I have like a, a Vox. Um, I have a Vox <laughs> set. performance. I have a Fender performance. I think I have two Fender performances, and I have a uh, um, a Marshall performance set. And uh, I went with the Ju- I think it was the Jubilee you recommended, the fifty nine Jubilee or whatever. No, no, it's the uh, the Purple Plexi. Purple Plexi, that's it. The first fifty nine yeah. Purple Plexi. Yeah, I went I went with that, and you know I haven't I haven't had to move from it. And the truth of the matter is, it sounds great. I've had people go, "That's the Kemper, really? Yeah, that's what it sounds like," and people are amazed. And um, not to, you know, not to do, do, do my own horn or anything, but when, when I hook that thing up, it's so easy and so, you know, so quick. And um, uh, I've gotten to where I'm taking it to open mics and I just take um, the FRFR just in case I don't get anything from the sound guy and I can just go with it. But the point is I can just hit to, I, I know what performances I'm going to use for what songs I'm going to do. and. I'm in, and I can be song to song as fast as any other musician can be song to song. Um, and the simplicity of it is there. The amp one, the simplicity of it is so. It, yeah, I mean, it's even good. more basic than the Kemper. In yeah. that, here, here's your three tone controls. They don't even change per channel. Like, I know, the, right? the, the thing is just designed to like work that way. And it, it's just incredibly well thought out. Like, Thomas Blue was on the show. Uh, if you haven't watched that episode, it's one of our best episodes ever. I would highly recommend you go back and watch that interview. But yeah. he is a mad scientist, and he's so yeah. good at it because because he's over engineered this thing within <laughs> an its life. Like everything in here is just really good. Uh, in fact, um, you know I love the purple plexi. If I had the Kemper still, that's what I would be using. Like that that preset pack is just amazing, and uh, yep. the amp one can do it, which is what's, yeah. what's 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 bonkers to me. It's Cause crazy, I'm like, right? Because I'm like wow, I've got this super warm plexi sound that isn't harsh. Like, what the hell? And, you know, out of, a, out of a solid state device with a one tube in the power amp um, that doesn't really do any sort of amplification. It's wild. He is the future. I, I, I will say it now. Um, somebody is going to either license this technology uh, yeah. or he's, they're going to hire him as an engineer to help them. And yeah. that's going to change things because he understands like, for for one thing, everything in that product is designed for the working musician, right? Like he's That's like, right. I'm gonna build this product that like a guy can take into a bar. I mean, literally in in the uh, the manual it says small club, big club, arena, right? And those are your volume like, settings. It has like a like a clock <laughs> that shows you yeah. like this is where you go if you're playing the arena, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, I do think it's funny though because he he mentioned on because uh, he he does his uh, live streams and he mentioned those live streams because I usually run it at four. For, for smaller club gigs. We right. had it at four today at good time. And uh, I was going to shit my pants. It was so loud. I mean, it was just yeah. ridiculous. And I was like, uh, I don't know if I would be playing this in a bar on four. <laughs> and yeah. Like, definitely you know, not with a, with a four by 12. <laughs> right, well, uh, yeah. Not, <laughs> it would be punishing. I was going to say, maybe with a one by 12. You know, it's, you know, it's funny. So I did a gig. I did an outdoor um, gig where I was at the beach. So you got the ocean noise, right? You got... The noise of traffic because right. you're on uh, Atlantic Avenue in Virginia Beach, and I had, um, you know, everything. Out, and I went, I handed the PA guy. This is when I had my amp one. Was using my amp one. Mm-hmm. I handed the PA guy my uh, uh, XLR cable, and I had a two by twelve on the stage. I had no problem hearing myself, and the crowd had no no problem hearing me, and I was very like right there. Mm-hmm. So. <clears throat> um, the the fact of the matter is, I had to turn down my this side, you know, that I was hearing on the stage because it was so damn loud. And that was on a stage that was probably 
40 feet wide. Okay. Uh, um, maybe 30 feet wide. And the, and the other guitar player was at the other side of the stage. He was like, you're too loud. I can't hear my own amp. And he's, <laughs> he's standing next to me. That's, that's how loud good, I was good, on that that's stage. That's a good problem to have. Um, and yeah, but the the um because I used the arena setting because I wanted to see how loud that yeah, was. Yeah, and yeah. And she was it was really, really loud. And yeah. so um uh what I what I wanted to to yeah. make with the point was um there you said it's for the working musician. This is literally something you can throw in your laptop bag. You can put it in your guitar gig bag. It weighs less than most novels and doesn't take up yeah. any more space. And it's than your, a hard and cover it is book. literally we were talking about it today. It's a sleeper amp. I'm taking it to the next open jam. I'm throwing it in the back of the cab. I'm literally going to carry the cab in yeah. and, and like not even hook the, the amp up. Like I'm going to wait until like it's time to play and then I'm going to hook the amp up and I'm going to be like, all right, here we go. Like, that's my amp. That's my whole rig for tonight. Cause, cause it, and, and it's just going to be a total sleeper thing. Yep. Like, what the hell is your, what are you playing through? Like, what is your, where's your amp? Coming? You know? Yeah, um, exactly. And I'm just going to laugh and be like, this is my amp right here. Um, it is amazing. It literally is amazing. It, the other thing, so the other benefit before we move on, because we got a lot of stuff yep. to cover tonight. There is I, another benefit to the amp one that I think a lot of people miss. Um, yep. And that is, so like, I, I was talking to a friend of mine and uh, he was saying like, I don't really want to use it on the floor. I want to use it on the, on the, the cabinet, which is fine, right? But I'm like, <laughs> why? I'm like, why wouldn't you use it on the floor? And he was kind of like, well, you know, I just, I don't feel comfortable having my amplifier on the floor. I, I kind of thought about it for a minute. I'm like, you know, I, there are it. People right, who... so I, I, I get it. But, but here's the thing. If you put this on your pedal board and you hook all your stuff up on your pedal board, how many cables do you actually have in going back to your amp on stage? Right. One. None. Yeah. The one, one. The, yeah. The one that goes to the to cab. That's it. That's it. And if you think that about, if you think about the benefit that, no more snake, no yep. more, you know, no more crazy cable spaghetti when you're yep. trying to, when you're trying to run four cable, like yep. none of that. I was just going to say your four cable method is so easy. Yeah. I so, mean, you plug it into remember the, I was running, the front, <clears throat> you take yeah, your cable was, around the back and that's it. I was running that and the, and the amp one, remember, or I mean, not, not the amp one, the amp one and the, um, the HX effects, uh, the HX effects. That that was a combination made in heaven. By the I've way. been thinking about putting the HX stomp on it, but I've been playing with my yep. discrete pedals, just seeing how mm -hmm. it takes pedals, and it does such a yeah. damn good and job. It does great, yeah. Um, um, the the uh, um, the other thing, and I know we're moving along fast here, and the other thing about it, and I just I just thought of this. There's so many people that put um, what is what is the Spark two hundred fifty dollars. The spark is yeah, it's, a, it's like down there. It's going to be right. four hundred before but, before it's over with this year. But I'm just saying that you can take the amp one, plug it into anything. Mm -hmm. You can plug it. In. You do not need a cabinet, folks. No, that's you can the, use the record the out, which doing. actually sounds pretty good. You could send the record out to your computer. You can use the record out to an FRFR. You can use the record out to a PA. You can record it right to your headphones. That's what I was just going to say. Put it in your headphones. You want to talk about a sleeper amp that you can literally travel with. This is the thing that, that a lot of people are like, oh, I need the amp one or I need the amp one mini so I can travel, blah, 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 blah. And it's like you literally don't need to make any noise to bother anybody else or you can and still use this thing. And that's what's amazing. You could travel in backline cabs with this thing. That's right. Like, that's, that's what, you know, everybody's got a 1960A at the, the backline render right. place. Just, yep. just have 1960As. No, because let's, let's face it. Everybody's nightmare with backline, right, is the amp that shows up. It's like everybody's kicked <laughs> around. Right. It's a piece of shit. It doesn't work. Yep. Um, yep. Get the 1960A cab. There's no moving parts. Yep. Plug your damn cable in and hope all the speakers are intact. Which they will, be. but if you're one of those, right? But if you're one of those people that's just traveling because you're you're going to a toothbrush conference or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in you your, just want something to work room, yeah, in the sure. hotel room. It's also that's just it, though. It is the jack of all trades in definitely, that respect, definitely. And that's what I love about it. That's that's truly what I love about. It. I would so, I great. would highly recommend anybody who's a uh, road warrior to get one of those. Do you have a what's new tonight or or not? Because I have one more, but but it's a fast one. I got I got nothing new. I all right. I literally have nothing. Cream, I get the Creamback Neo sixty or the Creamback Neo right the sixty five uh -huh, watt yep. Creamback. It's in my uh, Lone Star cab, black one behind me, which you can't see in frame. Um, and um, I've been really impressed. It 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 sounds like a really good Celestian speaker. 
you wouldn't know it's ne neodymium. Um, it has a, a characteristic to it that is like decidedly vintage, which is pretty wild given that it's like these rare earth magnets that are, you know, 10 times or 100 times stronger than the Al Nico. And the fact, the fact is, I put that in my cab. My cab weighs like maybe a, you know, maybe like eight pounds lighter or something. It's, it's crazy. Uh, I, it's not unruly anymore to move my Lone Star around. That well, this this black one, because my other one still got um, a uh, C90 in it. So I have a C90 in a box actually. So, I mean, I haven't decided whether I'm selling or keeping it. I was gonna sell it, to pay for the cream back, but I'm like, at this point, I like the I like the C90 too. So yep. for some reason, I inherited another cab, and I'm gonna put a C90 in it. I'll have one laying around. Um, right. It's got super low mileage on it too. Um, but and I think it may be what I do because because like if I ever get a two by twelve. And it's like V30s. I'm ripping the V30s out. I'm gonna put one of these in it in a creamback Neo in it. Um, yep. Because it, it's not a super expensive speaker. I think they're about 170 bucks. And because they're not using El Nico, they're probably not gonna go up as a result of you know international unrest. So, um. All right, let's move on. So all right. the uh, the topic du jour as of last as of last week, we're still dealing with the same um, the same kind of commentary here. Which is that there's still a tube crisis on. Um, I don't think anybody anybody would deny that. In fact, I bought a 12 AX7 today. Um, I will share with you that a dealer that I frequent has been selling tubes like hand over fist um, because literally people are coming out of the woodwork and ordering them on reverb, calling up the store that they haven't seen in 10 years, saying, yep. "You got any of these? You got any of these?" And they do have some in stock, but they won't probably tomorrow. I mean, that's that's how fast things are going off the shelf. They literally had someone call up and go, how many of these do you have? You know, like, we, I'm buying them all. <laughs> you know, as as intelligent, I'm going to, I, I want to say, I'm going to go to one and then the other thing, but I'm going to, I'm going to stick to this one thing. And that's this, what you're talking about right now. This toilet paper shortage, freaking buying off the shelf, bullshit that's going on right now, okay? Right, because right, right, number it... one, I, I ran the same amp for 15 years. Never changed a tube. I used my Lone Star for several years. Never changed, never had to change a tube. I do not understand. I understand that people do change tubes. But I don't think that this is for the average user. This is not the you. This is not the me who's out there at in a in a um, hundred degree weather with my amp running loud on a on a big stage in front of us. You know, in a, in a carrying um, it around all the there, time up and down stairs, right, in and out of the trunk, in and out of the stairs. This most of these people, and I'm not saying every one of them, but most of these people, and and I'm going to come back to the person that drags it around all the time. By the way. Most of these people that are going out and buying them in this this crazy thing, these are people who have never had to change the tube in their entire life. Yeah. But think they might. And just like – it's just no. like the toilet paper shortage. Cause, Actually, cause I, I, here's I, I, the other thing. Go ahead. Let me finish this. Because those of us who have dragged our amps in and out of the cars and those of us who have banged it around and those of us who have run it in, in really hot, humid – you go from a freezing cold um, uh, air conditioned space. Um, you're, they, they sit you right next to um, a fan where everything is cold, but you just brought it in from real humid. It, it, everything's the, the point is we're the ones who really put it through the paces, right? Our, our amplifiers, right? And I, I don't know how many times you've changed tubes and I'm sure you have. Um, I was lucky, but the point that I'm going to make here is this, the people who do that for a living, they know how many tubes they need and they have them. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's, if you have an extra set, one, one extra set of preamp tubes, possibly a power tube laying around or a matched pair, that's all you need. Really? Realistically, you don't even need a set of preamp tube. No. Um, I'm just so saying that would. That would be the max. I'm gonna I'm gonna blow the myth up here because I don't I don't think that's actually what's going on. I think the vast majority of people are changing their tubes too early, too often. They're listening to that, 
the gear page. They're listening yeah. to, um, they're listening to maybe even their local dealers who have got bad information, um, yeah. who are who are telling people you need to change them once every two years or once a year. Reality is, you change them when they break. I don't, That's and, right. and especially in this kind of a mentality and this kind of a shortage sort of situation, keep the tubes around for everybody, and just buy a set when you need it. Like what the hell? This whole like let's run out of tubes. It's just ridiculous. Um, I have. You, do you know what this is? That's a, this uh, is a light bulb made out of a broken tube. I figured it was an air freshener. A guy, yeah, it's kind of that. See the little light there? It lights up. All there is is a. It, he took. He takes broken tubes. It's guy in New York City, yeah, in Long Island, and he makes uh, tube um, tube night lights is what it is. And I just thank you. Um, I just find it funny that. Like you said, and I think also part of this is this, <clears throat> there's a lot of people who are still under the impression, and, and this goes back to what we were talking about with the, with the Kemper and the, and the Axe FX and everything else, that the bedroom player needs to change their tubes yeah, because realistically, it'll make you them don't. sound better. You have to really, Realist be, you have to be, yeah. correct. well, so like. <clears throat> I, I do believe that can be true. So like in certain it situations, is. like if you have, um, if you have an attenuator and you're running your, your amp really hard through the attenuator and you get the amp attenuated a lot, that's equivalent yep. to being on stage and the amp turned up. But here's the reality, right? Um, so even if you're doing that, you can get five or six years out of a pair of tubes most of the time before they break. Occasionally yep. you'll get one that gives up the ghost. And it might take the other one with it. And it might take your outport transfer with it. Like, yep. that's, I mean, that's the, that's the price we pay for, unfortunately, good tone. Um, but, I, but I just want to stress this. Like, if you think that, that you're, you're, I have to have five sets of output tubes because it's going to last me the rest of my life. First off, um, you, out of your five sets, maybe one of them will be bad, right? So now you're down, now you're down to four. And second off is like, what are you going to do when you, when you, you, you know, that the voltage on stage changes because we don't need enough. We, we're not going to be needing to, to draw as much from the wall. Like, what are you yeah. going to do in a venue can't support it? Cause that's going to happen. We're, we're heading yeah. in that direction. I mean, we are, we're not just in a tube crisis. We're in an energy crisis too. Um, yep. which, you know, those are, these are all things that are going to happen in the next, in my playing lifetime. Right. So like I've got, I've been playing yeah. 20 years. I probably got another 30 years to go. Um, so for maybe even, maybe even 40 or 50. Years. Um, but the reality is like, that's where, we're, that's where we're headed. Right. Is um, yeah. we're going to end up in a situation where people are going to be freaking out about things that really aren't going to matter much because you're not going to be able to do it anyway. Uh, no. the, the, we talked about this last week and I, and I really want to get to topic. So I want to make sure we put, we put a pin on this, but this is an esoteric technology. It's 55 yeah. years old or 55 years dead, right? Like it yep. should have yep. died in 1960. It, it, yeah. And, and we didn't allow it to die because number one, we had all these graveyard ideas that like I spent, I spent money on this and I need to keep it running in perpetuity until, you know, until it finally explodes. That's what was happening in the seventies. People in the seventies didn't care. Like the, some of them cared about their tone, but it was like, not like it is now, right? Where people are like, oh, I got to do all this stuff to get the tone. Stop it. Like, think about the practicality of it because that's how it was before. So, so they would run, you know, they would run tubes till they blew up. Right. And then their tubes yeah. lasted a lot longer because they were made in proper condition. Yep. Um, but if they knew what was going on now, like they, those people were, were, you know, around today and looking at this situation, they just laugh. They'd be like, well, what the hell? It's not a big deal. Now I know obviously there are old timers around that do care about their tone now because it's, it's the, the, you know, passion du jour, but it's <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. So the, the, the topic here is tubes are back, right? So, yes. they're, so they're back on the menu. Um, it, sort of. So uh, Mike Matthews, uh, what small guy that he is, Paid somebody off in Russia. I don't want to say what it is. I, you, can, you, can, you can dispute that till you're blue in the face. It's fine. But that's my version of events and probably very likely given this history. Um, and now they're going to allow them to export tubes into the United States again. 
Um, the letter was really vague, his letter out to, uh, you know, consumers. And it's, it's, I get the feeling it was almost like this is, this is subject to change. Um, cause they know that they're kind of getting by, by the skin of their teeth on this one. And so I'm not putting a whole lot of eggs into the EHX is going to deliver all these tubes back. Um, in fact, well, they were very clear, nothing showing up until April. Um, right. And uh, probably more importantly, there is one li one line in there, one statement in there that we can't forget. Prices are going to go up. Oh, yeah. I'm not worried about prices. And, and this whole, uh, let, let's, just, let, let's just be real. The people that are buying this stuff don't care about the prices. They'll pay $100 for a preamp tube. And that's where we're headed. Like, that's what I want to make very clear to everybody. The average consumer is going to get a price shock at some point when they walk in to buy tubes and it's 50 bucks for a 12AX up. And we are headed in that direction very, very quickly. In fact, the average price now is like 35 bucks. Okay. Yeah. Now, I yeah. have on my, did I put it away? I put it away. I have a 12AX7 I bought from Mace a couple of years ago. It was 18 bucks. Bought one today. It was, 20, yeah. it was $23. And I got it. It should be like $30. But I got it for $23 because was, that was what was on the label, right? So I'm kind of like, think about it. it. You know, this inflation is not new. We, we, we've been paying higher prices for tubes. I can remember when a set of six, a 6L6s was like 45 bucks. Now it's I remember $60. when a whole tube change was 75 bucks. I thought it was a lot of money. Uh, uh, that well, was everything. So, so that was the whole thing and the work. So I bought a quad, I bought a quad of EL84s, sight unseen. I don't even know where they're at right now. They're, they're coming in. Um, <laughs> I pre, I pre-purchased, uh, and it, I was told it's going to be about 90 bucks for four EL84s, but I'm like, I, I don't have any. So, so here's my thing. I don't have that spare set. So for me, a quad of EL84s, that'll keep me, that'll keep me, have me for 30 years, even in the playing conditions I put my amps, in, 30 years, because the reality yeah. is I'm not on stage cranking it to 10. When I'm playing my Mark, which is my EL84 power damp, my volume's at like, you know, what, like 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. Yeah. Um, and in which case, it's fine. It's not going to, I'm not going to just, e you know, erase my tubes from existence doing that. Now, if I was putting it on 10, you know, like 12 o'clock, or not t 12 o'clock, but like, you know, all the way over at like uh, 3, yeah, my tubes are going to be eating up faster. But the reality is this. I play them till they break. I don't play them till they get dark. Everybody else is like, oh, you know, I, I, it was like lifting a blanket off my amp when I replaced my tubes. Shut up. Did you AB it? Because you can't. Right. So right. some of that's bullshit. Number one. <clears throat> that's right. That's and, num right. and number two is even if you did, I mean, realistically, you have a trouble with presence control. So don't tell me that it's like night and day. You just try right. to travel your presence up a little bit more. Um, okay. so anyway, nine, nine times out of 10, they're remembering the last five minutes that they were playing right before the two, went out. right? But, um, so EHX, what? EHX is back on the menu apparently, and as of April, yeah, yeah. Now, we were talking about Sino last week in China. Sino is not come back online or anything, however, nope. um, Tube Amp Depot they have a partner in China and they've been actually looking yep. at building tubes. You know, yep. the X7 and all that, you know, the, the typical guitar tubes in China. And they are, yep. they're going to make uh, red, red something, uh, plate tubes or something like that. And it's, it, they're basically going to be red based tubes. Like they have a red yeah. base on them. But, um, so they've announced that they're going to do this, but there's no timeline. They haven't said when they're going to start delivering. They haven't yeah. said how much they're going to start delivering. And I suspect their production levels are probably going to be lower than JJ. Because your tube amp depot, what you really want is you want a tube that you can get in stock and charge outrageous money for because there's not many of them. And um, they have the power to do that in this situation. It was going to happen. So I, I, I see this... <laughs> Well, no, we're at, we're not in the likely what's likely to happen. I'll get there. Yeah, I'll we'll go get, to that. We'll, we'll get, get there. The, we'll what get we'd there. like to see happen first. So, and then and then of course I got a I got a survey from Western Electric. Somebody yeah. sent me a survey from Western Electric saying we make tubes. We've been making tubes for you know the entire time the last hundred years, and they're like, 
were thinking about getting into alternative tube markets. And then the questionnaire was like, which tubes did you like available? And every last tube on the list is using a guitar. Amp, which yep. is why it's very clear they're, they're, they're going to toss their hat into the guitar ring and they want to find out what tubes people are most interested in. And I literally, when I got this email, I checked them all. And then at the bottom, it says, um, <laughs> it says, uh, please, please in the suggestion box, uh, let us know, you know, uh, what you, if the, you have any other questions or concerns. And, and I basically said, please don't make them in a unfriendly nation. And also please, uh, do it sustainably. Yeah. Which means we're probably going to play higher higher prices just so we control the quantity which are being produced and all the garbage we're pumping into the atmosphere and everything else by doing right. um and the waste and the yep. landfill and all that. Which I'm okay with that. Like I'm listen, when it, we, we we're living on this planet through through my life. Uh there are gonna be people leaving this planet in my lifetime, but we're living on this planet until I'm dead. And we we're not we're not advancing fast enough for us to be right moving on to a new place where we can source new materials and stuff. So we got to make the most of what we got. So, you know, like, let's be conservative with our tube usage, please. This whole thing of, I'm going to use my tubes for a year and then throw them in the trash. Stop it. Just stop it. Get I, some help. You know what? I'll take those, those uh, used tubes. Um, same. Same. They're going to be going up on eBay and they're going to be $100 a piece on eBay. I'll take them. Um, you know, Yeah. I'm going to let you finish with the so tubes are back thing. Because, again, you get to that sustainability thing. I'm going to – I'll be completely honest. I had a, I had a tube amp on order. I'm not, I don't anymore. I'm not going to – I'm not going to do it. Not because um, I'm Greta Thornburg, but I am concerned. And I don't want to be part of the problem as, li- as much as I cannot be part of the problem. I still have to air condition my home. I still have to heat my house. I still have to drive sure. to and from places. I do have an electric microbus on order. Mm-hmm. I mean, I am thinking in the future, but I want a Maverick. Uh, I went to go look and see uh, how soon I can get on the list, and not till August. Um, yeah. but I will be. I will be there at the dealer when they open on August. I'm not saying the date because I don't want anybody to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, so, which vehicle is that? The the Ford Maverick. That's their their oh, hybrid, yeah. hybrid truck. You know, it's funny that the Maverick is going to be a hybrid truck. I had a Maverick. My, I shouldn't say I had. We had one as a family vehicle when I was a kid, and that was a pretty shitty car. So I'm just I'm just interested in how the truck looks, and, and I have high hopes. It looks I really good. do. It looks good. I, I, it's not just that. I just want the gas mileage. Like my my yeah. escape gets shit mileage compared to that. No, I'm yeah. a musician. I'd like to have a a truck so I can haul right. my crap. Um, well, that's why I'm looking at the microbus. I'm actually looking at the version of the microbus because there's two versions. The microbus is going to be the hipster go out and hang out at the beach version, which right. there's nothing wrong with that. That that's a great version, and it's and it's go, it harkens back to the Scooby Doo era. Um, but the other one is. Like you're doing work with it. You're a painter and you haul paint, yeah. stuff like that. So you do have an option of, you know, hiding and moving the seats. And I'm like, that's the one I want. That's the, so I can fill the back of it with a PA or fill the back with it with my amps and stuff and, and go to the, to go to a gig. Sure. And the other one would be fine for me. I I'm on the list. I'm, I've been on the waiting list for two years. I don't see it coming around for another couple of years. Um, they even said, I mean, a good estimate right now is 2024, but I will get it when it comes out. And, you know, but the point is, it's a sustainability that we have to start looking at with things that we're getting. And we have to start, we have to start thinking in that way. I mean, we're, we're not really that old of a country and we've been destroying it ever since we got here. And, you know, again, I don't want to get on a high horse because I'm not that person. I'm not out there telling people they should throw their cans in this box and that other stuff in that box. I'm the last person to do that to you. I'm just saying that that because we all have to make decisions. Some of them are not sustainable. Yeah. You know, well, we're talking and some of them are while we're on this topic. I think it's worth mentioning because um, we didn't have like a whole eco side of this, but it's worth mentioning that like solid state amps are wasteful as shit, too. <laughs> um, most of them end up in the landfill because yeah, because you have grown, right? They're garbage and they're. Yeah. I, most of them are designed to be a throwaway piece of equipment. They're not, they're not designed to grow with you. They're not designed to sound good. They're designed to get a job done really fast. 
In other words, get you to practice, that kind of thing. And when people get done with them, they just throw them out or they recycle them. And like, if you recycle it, great. But I could, I have a secret to tell you. Your recycling isn't generally going anywhere. It usually gets up on a slow boat to China where they dump it in the ocean because yep. they have all these recycling contracts for massive stuff. And we send it over there and then they don't have anything to do with it. Um, so they just dump it in the ocean. Great. Yep. It's, a, it's a wonderful way to live. Um, yeah. So that's, I mean, if you want that change, go, go talk to your local Congress people, but um, True. I um, go look to find out where yeah. your, where your recycled paper usually goes. It, it, it batteries yeah. even worse. I, I, I don't even want to go down that road. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but, but so my point is it's not just tubes, right? Like yep. there's a whole other, com maybe we'll do an episode about it. There's a whole other conversation here about sustainable guitar and the idea that like, we actually historically have been really good about hanging on to things that are good, right? Um, so, like, people still have 1968 Plexis, right? That's, that's a thing. And people have 57 Strats and that stuff. Like, a lot of that didn't end up in landfills. Um, so, I just want to point this out. Like, the last 20 years or 30 years of guitar has made a plethora of garbage. And people buy garbage. And I'm imploring the companies behind said garbage to stop. That is, that is really the issue here, right? Consumers will buy. If, if they make a product, even if, it's, even if it's crap, consumers will buy it. Someone will buy it. And, that, and that's part of the issue. So like when we talk about tubes, think about the waste of tubes that go into things like that Fender Champion 600. And the yeah. I, I know people are going to hate me when I say this, but the Blues Junior and the Hot Rod Deluxe. Wouldn't you rather see those go into professional level amplifiers? I mean, I, I'm not I'm not saying that those amps are terrible. But what I'm saying is, like, if you got to use them, use them in the right application. And let's let's try to, you know, make that middle market more like sustainable digital amps that are highly upgradable. Could you imagine yeah. if you had a socketed digital amp and they could send you a new processor to put in it when it when the new one comes out and then just update your firmware? Because let's face it, we all know the Strymon platform is the same Sharks the Shark DSP that it's been for what ten years. I mean, that's that's the kind of thought process where I where I see a sort of a broken model. And with them, that's a whole other conversation. Like digital effects. Okay, so I'm going to buy this digital reverb. And I'm going to buy this digital delay and I'm going to buy this digital other thing. Why don't they just put them in one box with one chip instead of having four different SKUs because they want to sell products at a lower price point. So, in, so we end up with more digital landfill garbage. And that's the kind of stuff that like we need to start reinforcing this behavior and kind of get this mindset wrapped around us as guitar players that we can have a, we can have a situation where Look, if we all buy the digi the delay and reverb that's really good, that's all packaged in one box, that sends a message to the manufacturers that that's the product you need to make, and they'll lower the price because they don't have three SKUs with three different boxes and three different designs and, and three different engineering teams doing it. Because that's that's the, the the mindset we have to get them into, and the only way we do that is vote as consumers. Um, I I still I stand by what I said a minute ago, which is like. I would rather see high end tube amps made than low end stuff that that people don't like. And I'm thinking about the Valve Junior, right? Like there's an amp that literally came off the line that everybody ripped the tubes out of immediately, modded the shit out of them, and then put new tubes in them. It's like, why bother? What why did they do that? What what was what was the purpose there? Like, number one, keep the original tubes in it. Number two, why would you buy an amp that you have to mod because they made it like crap? So you fell right into their trap, right? Now you have all this landfill shit you just made. All the capacitors you pulled out threw in the trash are now, you know, poisoning the environment. It's not good. We should stop doing that. But it's not just, I mean, obviously, guitars drop the buck. We're a very small market, but I don't want to encourage people to think that way. Because right. if we continue to think that way, we're going to be continue going down the same path of, well, it doesn't matter because I'm, I'm not bothering other people. I'm not, you know, like, that's that's the wrong way to think about it. We, now we're in a tube yep. crisis, right? So now you start right. thinking like, how do I get more mileage out of the tubes that I have? 
Well, don't put them in garbage first off. That'll help. <laughs> you know. What? You don't want the mono price? 61. Oh my eight. God. Don't even get me started. I'm so sick and tired of seeing mono price pop up in Facebook groups. Oh, the mono price 1x12 amp is so good. Bullshit. Bullshit. I have not heard a clip of that amp that even makes it a modicum of, oh, I'm I got, interested. It's garbage. We got a, we got a, um, a friend of mine. He might even listen to this. I hope um, so. Who, yeah, your who, amp sucks, um, buddy. Has one. And it does. It sucks. <laughs> I mean, but he loves it. I don't and, care and if he loves it. It sucks. I'll I, tell you. You sucks. like a sucky amp. It's okay. You like a sucky amp. It's bad. It sucks so hard. And and I I don't have the the you know I don't have the heart to tell him. Um, I do. That that yeah, <laughs> they have is just horrible. It's got no no real good tones to it whatsoever. <sighs> it's like it's that lo-fi sound that you know you would put on um, like an old Beatles record or something, but. Well, I mean, I can see it being like, uh, kind of like an early deluxe or something. It's just like a trash speaker. Yeah. And, but yeah. but here's yeah. the reality, right? Like, it's not a good amp. It just isn't. No. You might like the tones that it. All all products have a place. You know, they do things right. that are that are right. good for certain people and whatever. But that product is not designed to be good. It's designed to be cheap. And right. It's. Right. It's it's niche is very, very small. And because yep. of that, like, yeah, okay, so somebody might like it, but the reality is, you know, they're making way more of those goddamn things than they should. Um, right. That's so absolutely right. That That's all I'm getting at. Yeah. Those things are going to be started to be farmed for, and that's the dangerous part, too. They'll start buying those cheap ones because they'll be farming them for tubes. There's there's right. idiots that are already right. doing that's already that. Do, that's already happening. And then happening. again, that starts filling landfills. Yeah, um, because we get, and we get, and let me tell you, you think those tubes are tested like Groove tubes or or uh, Mesa Boogie does? Hell no! <laughs> it's like <laughs> you'd be lucky if you turn the amp on, and it works. Um, they don't care. It is cheaper, and this is the thing that I was telling my son because my son got um, some paints. He got some stuff for a, the project he's doing um uh of the, on his own and so he got this model paint it's really small tubes but they're expensive because it's a very specific right. kind of paint so he gets it in and they were sent, supposed to send him three golds this t the story is going somewhere three types of gold well they gave him two gold and uh, two of the same type of gold and one gold doesn't work so he wrote to him and he said hey i'm missing the, this one gold so they said, okay they sent him a whole new set because it's cheaper for them to replace the thing than to ask him to return it. Mm -hmm. And so you, again, the mono price, by the time it gets over here from where it was, think about this. These, these things are 200 to $300. I think the expensive one is 300 bucks. That, um, unless you get in the 50 watt, I'm talking about the little combo things. Like that. So the point is they send these things over here. It is not worth their time and effort to get that thing back. It is also not worth their time and effort because you think about this. QA and QC cost money, okay? It costs money to test. If I don't have to test, <coughs> I don't have to pay that person in QA. I don't right. have to create a QA department. I don't need a manager. I don't need the staff. I don't need the right. testing. I don't need the, I don't need the facilities. I don't, I don't even need a tube procedure. tester. Yeah, I mean – I just stick the shit in there that was sent to me by whatever tube company that I'm using to source these things. Oh, God. I stick them in. I put that thing and I ship it out. And if it doesn't work, I just send you another one. Mm -hmm. oh, God. And again, that's the thing that filled up landfills. I, I started seeing this when I got a little older. I got into my 20s and 30s. I was a yuppie. Okay. And it was, it was oh, that doesn't work anymore. You take your TV to get it fixed. You, talk, you threw it in the garbage one. and you got a new one. And we're talking about old cathode rays. And they go, well, oh, excuse me, we can't take your cathode ray tube TV because it's got um, dangerous stuff in it. But if it's broken, we can. So what you do is you, you just take a sledgehammer it. and smash it. The, that's the truth, people. I'm not the only one that did it. I'm not proud of it. But that's what happened. Yeah. So you'd see – that's why you'd see – Tube TVs, the old cathode ray TVs, with like oh, a smashed front end and a bunch of masking tape over it or something to keep people from cutting themselves. 
and then it would go in the trash because then you could throw it in the trash. You know how much of that um, dangerous chemical went anywhere? It went right into your lungs when you smash a damn thing. Yeah. And then you threw it in the garbage. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it went wherever where the garbage went. And and if you think a, a tube that's this big, if you think these things don't have dangerous stuff in them, yeah, look when at they're what, made, look at what's in the getter. I mean, they're, they're in mm -hmm. there, right? And that's <laughs> there's a plate, um, uh, uh, you know, your plate voltages. You've got your um, your various voltages. The, the collector, the these things. Um, the manufacturing have, process is literally all lead and asbestos. Yeah, so it's, it's ridiculous. It's, yeah, it's all lead and asbestos. It, it's still 1920s technology, 1930s technology. You are not going past that. Yeah, right? is that that's even tubes predate that, right? And these yeah. are these are small tubes compared to the ones that they used to use. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, again, you talk about are we where we want to go? Where we want to go? Are we on that part yet? Uh, yeah, so that's what I was going to say. We're, we're we're just we're eclipsing. We're we're crossing over. To what we'd right. like to have happen. What I'd like, what I'd like to see, and of course, I, look, it's Jim's world, not not everybody else's world. Dave's world's going to be different, and that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. Jim's world is not going to buy any more tube amps. It's not going to happen. I'm going to stick with the stuff and and move forward. And if Thomas Blug's tube, if you're going to say Jim, you're actually getting a tube. If you're going to call that thing a tube, fine. Then I'm going to tube. Um, a single tube, though. Which is a single far tube that will never get replaced. Far more right, conservative than having an amp with, right. like my Mark V that has seven tubes in it, <laughs> and it's designed to last forever. So here's the point. Um, but the other, but the other side of it is, um, and I've said this before, and I, and I went back on it, but you know, I really have reached a peak of gear, and. And the thing, the thing is, I mean, I bought little things like I bought that collector's item. Nothing uh, really excites uh, Jim or I very much anymore. No, I mean, I, I was just talking to David before we started this. It was a couple of Les Pauls that showed up at Guitar Center. I was like, ooh, those are nice. But did I really want to open my wallet for them? No, because the truth of the matter is I have four Les Pauls. They're not and different than the current ones you have. It's another yeah, one. It's, it's another like, one. <laughs> do I really need that one because it's pretty? I mean, no. And I think in this world, um, and uh, uh, I hate to use um, another YouTube channel's um, thing, but uh, it was Phil McKnight who was talking about how people who buy $200 guitars buy a lot of $200 guitars. People who buy, you know, $1,000 guitars, they buy a lot of $1,000 guitars and so on and so forth. And, uh, there's the there's the Trogleys of the world. Trogley makes me laugh, and and don't get me wrong, I don't. It, hey, I don't. <clears throat> the guy is, does what he does, and he's great at it, and and you know, God help him for for saving all these guitars that he hopes to make a museum that ten people will go to, but um, and two of them will pay. But the thing is that you know, in the grand scheme of the world. But the thing is, when I look at it and I look at what he's got, he's got like a hundred guitars. Yeah. And I think to myself, here's a guy that really isn't a good player. He can't he's even not, play. Not, he's, a, he's a pure collector <clears throat> is what he right. is. Right. He's a pure collector. Um, his playing ability is, is way subpar, especially a guy, for a guy who's been playing on YouTube for nine years. Subpar. And, but, but that's not to take away from what he does. And I don't want to take away from what he does. And that is a pure collector and 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 a documenter, a historian of the guitar. And that's cool. And that's what he does. But my point is, at some point, you, you've got so much. Where's it going to go? I mean, and that's the thing. He, the next person that takes it is his kid or his grandkid or his great-grandkid. <clears throat> where does it go from there? And where, again, we get to that that thing. You've got... We've all got these guitars, whether we've got $1,000 guitars, $2,000 guitars, or $200 guitars. We've got pickups that have magnets, and they're ceramic, and there's, you know, the Alnicos and everything else. All this wire, everything that we've talked about in our years. And this has really come to a head with me relatively recently over the last, like, two or two years or so, is that 
you know, as much as I make fun of the Greta Thornburg thing, I just think that people took advantage of her. I think she, she's got a great message. And that is that we need to start, we do need to start thinking about this little ship that we're spinning in space on. We only got so much time. We only got so much space. And I think Bill Maher said it best a couple of weeks ago with a thing he did with Ben Shapiro. He goes, and he goes, I'm not worried about it. this plan will be here. I could, I could smoke, drink, and work my way to the end of it. And, and it's still going to be here. I'm, I don't have that much time left. But what about the kids? What about you? You have more time than me. Yeah, and then, well, it's not just me. It's my kids. And your kids and, and our grandkids-to-be. And, and that's who I worry about. And, you know, there's the, you know, the Nietzsche thing and all that other stuff that goes on. But the point is, we can make it better. Yeah. Or at least slow it down. Yeah, shit. Holy I mean, shit. Yeah. You know? I mean, we, 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 have, we have had 200 years of wastefulness. Like, our, our entire culture is built and predicated upon the idea that we can just throw shit away. So I totally identify with this. Um, what would I like to see happen? I mean, uh... All right. Ideally, like I'd like to see a world where somebody somebody steps into the tube game and revamps the idea and says, "Yeah, we can make tubes. We can make a product. It's not even almost a tube. It's just a product that that does what a tube does, yeah. but doesn't do the harmful shit to the environment. Is you know on par price wise. I don't mind if it's more. I mean, honestly, for yeah. me, it's like uh, as long as it lasts. You know, the same amount of time." Um, and it's made outside of, of what I, I wouldn't, I don't want to characterize them as enemies because they're not enemies of us. Like, I don't really no, believe in that, no, that no. whole, that whole thought process, but like a place that's going to remain trade neutral to us. And if there's no environmental impact, there's no reason it can't be here in the States itself. Um, right. so that we have a place where we can purchase an item that keeps our amps running for the foreseeable future. Um, that's, that's, that's the perfect scenario. What do I think is really going to happen? I are not really going to happen, but like, what do I, what would I like to see happen that, that is more probable? I would say I'd like to see Fender and, and, um, other United States based companies, um, leave the tubes for the, for the boutique companies. And I'd like, yep. to, I'd like for Fender to double down on the Tone Master and, and that concept and yeah. really pu push the envelope and make a product that is just, like this is a tube amp, it just doesn't have tubes in it, and like not not have to make it a sales point that it's that it doesn't have tubes in it. Like it shouldn't be about the amp being light; it should be about the amp sounding correct. And um, that's that's a side effect benefit, right? I'd like to see um more companies explore the Thomas Blue ideology of like how do we get away with using as few tubes as possible, um, for building a product that you know will outlive us. Yeah, I would like to see. Um, I would like to see more of that. I would like to see uh, companies like Quilter. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of Quilter's products. I've kind of gone back and forth. I've played a couple of their amps over the years. Um, today I got to see a micro block and uh, I've played some of their pedal board amp platforms. I did not like the pedal board platform amps at all, that they were garbage. Um, but, but the tone block I heard today was not it was not bad, and uh, in the application where we were using it, it was uh, it was feasible. Like it made sense. Um, I would like to see more products like that. I want to see. I actually want to see us go more pedal board focused, and I want to see things become more convenient because I see so many other uh, musicians who can literally just walk into a club and go on stage and not have to have all the hassle that we do. Um, like a drummer still has to carry their drums, right? And then like. Keyboard players still carry a keyboard usually, but they don't, they're not like uber concerned about what their amplifiers are in the way that we are. They're not concerned about their cables in the way that we are. They're not, I mean, like they don't get super, super granular and talk about, you know, the, the alloy of their strings or, you know, we, we have for whatever reason, because guitar is so popular. Um, the level of granularity and detail that has happened as a result of people going on the gear page and talking to one another about what they do has just gotten insane. I have seen some some conversations that just seemed like, I mean, it just seems like they're on some sort of drug and they're like focusing on the super finite. And it's just, it's unreasonable. And that's what's led to our climate where we're at now. 
This is why people are going and trying to clean out tube stores because they're under the impression that I have to have new tubes every show. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you can find somebody if you look hard enough that's like that. It's like, I got to have new tubes every time I play out. No, you don't. You never did. That's, that's a complete bullshit idea. But we need to stop that, you know, and the, the, whole, um, the whole methodology. If we're going to be in a tubeless society or a tube-less society, I want to see the amp companies shift their focus. And I know we talked about that in the last show, was that, like, they put all their eggs in the tube basket for, like, 30 years past its sustainability. And there's really no reason for it, especially with amp in the box pedals getting as good as they are. I mean, I have a solid-state preamp up there that's, like, second to none. And it sounds just as good as an amp. It doesn't have power amp attached to it. Um, and I have, you know, I now have the amp one, and that's sort of the same thing, except it has a tube in it. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to see, like, alternative products crop up that don't suck. Like, is it that hard? Because we know that there are products that are alternatives that do suck. Um, I can point at the new Vox, new tube-powered, tiny Vox amps. They're garbage. <laughs> um, I'm not afraid to admit that I'm not a big Vox amp fan anyway. But they haven't had a really good digital modeling amp since the ADV, uh, like 60, the big one. Not the, oh, not yeah. the ones yep. with the silver grills, but the big one, the yeah. original one they did. When, they, when Line 6 was still doing the Flexstone stuff, they brought right. out their modeler, and it was actually quite yeah. good. And um, they had that floor model, the, um, the Tone Lab which is SE. The, literally just the preamp was, out of the big guy. That's right. Yeah. In the, on the floor. That was great. And the two 12AX7s that were in it, they didn't do dick in them anyway. They, they were there for lighting. Yeah, well, I, I, mean, I don't know if they did anything or not, but, but uh, I can tell you that those My understanding is that they, they, they were, did nothing. They really. were significantly warmer than, the, uh, yeah. than, their, than their alternatives at the time. And and I can say this, I know that like the Vox or the uh the Marshall Valve State stuff, the t you could remove the tube and it continued to function. At least the first yeah. series. The well, I never tried made. to take my tubes out of the tw the Tone Lab SE, but I can tell you right now, I've literally looked at those a couple times on reverb and thought, you know, I could use it in another one, but I've got the camper. It would, it, you it don't would need be another redundant. one there. It would be it would be purely for um nostalgia purposes. Nostalgia, exactly. And I don't need to do that. Um so that's that's kind of my my gut gut shot on what I think is gonna ha or what not what I think is gonna what what we, I'd like to see happen. I don't know if you got any comments on that, Jim, or if that sparked any any thoughts. No, I, I agree. I, I mean, I I'm in total agreement with that. I mean, you and I are kind of saying the same thing. I mean, in that in that uh, I'd like to see more companies. Look, I've got the Tone Master Twin, and I'm all in on that. I like it, and I and it takes my pedals just it as hits, well. I think. It's so funny because those are hit or miss. Like the twin and the deluxe, they got really right, and then they did the deluxe yep. too, which is the the um the fawn colored one with yeah uh, with the the cream back in it, which is a brilliant idea, and then, that apparently is really good. But then they did yep. that they did the uh, super reverb, and I've heard a lot of people say yeah. the super reverb is shit. Yeah, that that that's not that that's the swing and a miss. Yeah, um, so it's like what the hell? How did they get the other two Sinam right? You know, like what what happened there? Um, yeah, I I don't get it. But the, but the thing that that I'd like to see is be, is more of that and and better. Like having one that has a twin and the deluxe in it or something like that. You know well, what I mean? Well, I, I think the the main difference there is that the power output and the and the multiple speakers. So I think that that's probably not that's probably no conceit thing. But it would be yeah. nice if you had one that had like um like one preamp from one amp on it and one preamp from right. another from the other or right. do the supersonic which was which was yep. a sleeper amp but do it yeah, in it digital was. um yep. those are the kind of things that like they're low-hanging fruit what about a yeah. reverb? i mean you could do a 15 inch speaker combo in tone master well, <clears throat> do you know what i'm saying why like, not why not instead of making an 800 dollar uh What's the little one you mentioned? The Fender uh, uh, Blues Junior. Instead of doing an eight hundred dollar Blues Junior, get it come back out with to a the price point where it's four hundred dollar. Right, get a four hundred dollar Blues Junior because you can put in. They've got the valve tech. I mean, the the technology in the in the solid state. They could pump out a Blues Junior that does just as well. Weighs half as much. Weighs yeah, weighs a lot less. 
and would be just as good, just as good. Because believe me, the Blues Junior could benefit from the, uh, as you know, as you well know, the um, technology of that, whatever they're doing in the Tone Master series. Do a Tone Master Blues Junior. That thing would fly off the shelves. Come on. Because it's a, it's a I actually, ramp. I would actually argue, don't do a Blues Junior Tone Master. Do a Deluxe. Do a deluxe, yeah. Or and do the do the Deville, do the deluxe, or the or well, I'm just saying, do an actual deluxe, like like the original right. deluxe, and then do one, you know, with a ten inch speaker, a Princeton, a Tweed Princeton yep. with a ten inch speaker that weighs like six pounds, nothing. you know, yeah, because uh, it's going it to weigh, weigh virtually nothing, and uh, yep. those would sell very very well, and they would get used, and they wouldn't end up junk. Here's the other thing. That's right. And I think this is this is the 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 reason why amp companies are hesitant to do this. They know they're going to be playing the software engineering game, which is that right. when you once you start getting into the digital world and that becomes your primary modicum, it becomes an arms race of technical details. And True. I almost think there needs to be like a gentleman's agreement between the amp companies in order for them to make this to make this work. They do not talk about the tech that's inside. Like true because you know there'll be some pissing match, dick measuring contest between two guitar players about mine has a has a sixty four bit processor. You know yeah. what difference does it make if it sounds good? It sounds good, and that's what they need right. to be saying. And uh, I, I'll, I'll take that to the next step because I'd also like to talk about another amp manufacturer that should do what Fender's doing, um, and that is that. Nobody cares what the Tone Master does. Right now, nobody cares what the software is in the Tone Master because it does the twin, the twin or the, you know, the, the whatever well. So who cares what the software is? Nobody cares what the processor is. N nobody gives a shit. And they don't even update the software. It's not like you're, you're going to update it, although they have come out with a thing where you could get a little bit of tone out of it. But the point is that it's a very, like, here's a Fender Twin. Like it or leave it. And <coughs> hey, Marshall. Give us a good Tone Master Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Give us a Tone Master, um, uh, you know, Plexi. Come on. You can't tell me you can't do that. Hot take. Marshall's dead. Stop worrying about him. Yeah, not, I think not that's what do it anything. is. Marshall's gone. I, I, they're done I think for. you're right. They're done for. Unless they come right. out with some stellar product at the end of this year, they're done for. Their, yeah. their last big announcement was a fucking jukebox. I know. I'm saying that yeah. with all disdain for the company because they have a long legacy that we should be thrilled for them to protect and we should be happy that they are protecting it and they're not and nope. they're not going to they're not even making they're not even making a least amount of an effort to make us believe that they give a shit about the customer or about the the future of their own freaking company no they don't, don't even get they don't, started they don't care and so that's why I don't even want to talk about Marshall. That's a whole other conversation for another for another episode. You want to see me yep. rage for 20 minutes? Let's talk about Marshall. Because Marshall is a company <laughs> that I care about. It, and, and, and not me too. And I, and I they cannot don't. And they don't. I cannot understand who is in charge of that company and why they are running it into the ground like they are. And I know there are going to be that's people right. on the, watching this show. I buy Marshall products. I bought their Bluetooth speaker and their cell phone. And all this crap. What are you going to do when you're dead? Because yeah. there, my generation is not buying knickknacky shit like that. No, it's just not nothing. happening. Like nope. you, you, you are living in a fantasy land. Those people will market to the people who have money, and when you roll over in your grave, your money's going with you. It's not yep. coming back to us. It's going to pay off all your damn debt. Which is why I'm sitting here yep. laughing and like Marshall's done for. They've already kicked the bucket. And honestly, this is the same problem we've talked about with Gibson too. Is they've kicked the bucket too because they still haven't Marshall figured it out. They, Marshall right, kicked they, the bucket when Jim but when Jim Marshall kicked the bucket in a literal it, sense. It, it really, he really, and, it really did. And Gibson's latest announcement has got me so I, I'm. Wait, I'm well, like, maybe we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that before the gig report because I want to talk about that because I because I I have very strong feelings about that and I want to yeah, I want to re I really want to talk about why and this a comes with a guy with this colossal failure. Um. All right, so we got one more segment to do with tubes here. Uh, let me go. Yep. Yeah, okay. So we're going to talk about what's likely to happen. So now right. we, we, we paid to see the rainbow and ponies. Like, this is what we'd hope would happen from this. Yep. Um, 
we'd we like won't. you know we want to see a tube alternative we'd like to see a, we'd, <laughs> we'd like to see tubes we'd like to see yep. a tube alternative that's basically a tube we'd like to see the amp sure. companies step up to the plate and start producing amplifiers that aren't just tube amps that are actually right. good um right. but what's likely to happen and nothing I, nothing you it's know gonna stay you know what's going to happen right now inflation you, the, yep, they're going to inflate, and you know what's going to be worse? There's going to be these jackasses. Five years from now, there's going to be jackasses who are like, you know, if you've got tubes that are pre-2022, those are the good ones, man. You should hold on to those because those are the good tubes. The ones that came out 2022 and later, those are the bad tubes. You're going you're gonna to want that. You know that mono price? You're going to want to buy one of those mono prices and take tubes out of that because that's those are the better tubes they were making before. You know, there, there's going to be the pre lawsuit guys. You know what I mean? Uh, yes. And there's going to be the um the ones that go um there. Uh, there's going to be the other side of it that's going to be like, no man, those aren't good tubes. The new tubes are the good tubes, and yeah, there's going to be the tube wars of of um, 2027. That's nothing. I'm just saying it's nothing new. That, I mean, it's already that's, going on. Well, yeah. I'm just saying that, that this is what's going to happen because, um, you know, especially EHX. Oh, those are the pre-2022. When he made that deal with the Russians, he really did this, and they colluded with that, and now Trump had something to do with it or some ridiculous thing like that. Somebody's going to throw something in there that's got nothing to do with it because they just want to make their tubes more expensive than the tubes that are over here. <laughs> that's, that's all I see in the future, and I see no changes. You know why I see no changes? And here's the thing. With the exception of Thomas Blug, Okay. And, and we talked to him. I mean, that guy, like you said, mad scientist, he, he was like talking to a, a six year old that was wanted to show us all of his toys in his I, house. I mean, he, really fun. Great guy. He, I, had a kind, I had a kindred soul experience with that man. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's how I am. He's so awesome. So awesome. Seriously. I, I can't wait to meet him <clears throat> and, and talk with him in person. But here's my, here's my thing <clears throat> um, that I, that I want to say about the tube, the whole tube thing um, that, that, that has kind of, What's the word I want? Exploded in our faces in, in, in this. I don't care if it's uh, um, what what boutique tube company we talk about right now. There's a lot of them. They're mostly these hipsters. They're mostly the mostly these young Greta Thornburgs. Okay, who are telling you, yeah, I, I got up this morning and I ate my my free range chicken and I had some or they don't even eat chicken. You know, I'm vegan. So I don't do that. And my pot comes from, you know, ground that was and we we, we source our, our, you know, and then they make two amps. OK, I'm just going to say it. And then they're there. And if that's not them, that's still their clientele, dude. I'm, you know, I, I sell my tube. And it's so my my tube is free range. And it's it's it really is, cool. And, I, and I then, know Jim's and, and then I here, sell but, it. For, but he's he's not wrong. Like, no, I, just, have, I know many people in this community who are vegan, but like have like leather covered amps. Yeah, and it's yeah, like that's what I'm. What the hell? I, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. That 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 they're okay. They're they're on their cell phone that's got a lithium battery in it to do, use their lithium battery car to go to the a tube amp and buy this thing that was built in another country. It's okay. It's not fucking up our our environment, right? It's not screwing up our cow. You're not eating our animals. It's, we all breathe the same right, air. Cut. Point is, cut it out. Why don't these guys who are so freaking genius, if they're such sonic geniuses? Shut up and do something good for the fucking environment. Get your ass into something that really is sustainable. And and make your amps out of stuff that's sustainable. Make your I don't care if your amp is covered in hemp or whatever the hell it is. If it's sustainable, that's awesome. But the point is, do something that shows the reality of what you say that you say that you're doing and there's a reason for me to give you $3,500 or $4,000 for your freaking boutique amp, your milkman and your, uh, you know, all these other things that are so for, I, I know I'm stepping on a bunch of people's toes here and, and people are like, Oh my God, Jim, you're so full of shit. Look that, that freaking tube and that amplifier is no better or worse than my freaking Marshall when it comes to not, not necessarily the workmanship. I'm not saying that that's not point to point. The guy didn't stay up all night and, 20 hours a day or some shit like that. I'm just saying that it's no more or less sustainable. Mm. And that's what I'm getting at. 
All right. All right go ahead. That's here's, that's what I'm saying. Nothing's going to change. Here's what I think is likely to happen. Oh, no. Things are going to change. But but they're not the things that people think are going to change. You know what's going to happen? Mom and pop amp companies, <laughs> small, small, small tube amp companies. Yep. When we go through this tube apocalypse, they're closing their doors. You're gonna see you're gonna see companies like Milkman go under because they're not gonna be able to get tubes. And you're gonna see I, I all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna rattle off a couple of names here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on one AM company in particular because I've heard this I've heard this from three people in the last couple of weeks. Um car ampl amplification, right? Which car is a fine company, right? They make a good product. I've played a couple of their I amps over the years. Um they might be remind me a lot of Greer, actually. Um, who's also a good company. Um, but but Car has convinced some of their users that they have a special selection process for tubes. Um, I'm here to kind of blow the just blow this myth right out of the fucking water. No one has special pixie dust, fairy dust tubes. Stop it. There are tubes. They come from one of three factories in the world right now. Um, unless they're new old stock. If they're new old stock, that's a whole other scenario. Which car may actually be new old stock. So I may be I may be totally off base here. But realistically, like even the new old stock thing is sort of mythological at this point. Because most of your new old stock tubes aren't new. They're used. People are telling you they're using black, you know, black label Jan Phillips or something like that. They didn't get those new. They're they're not laying around in boxes anymore. And when they are, they're four hundred dollars a piece. So th Realistically, if you have an amp where you have a four hundred dollar preamp tube in there, you're doing something wrong. Okay, you're you're thinking about this the wrong way because the tube doesn't matter that much. And I'm here to tell you that I don't care what you're gonna tell me, tube does not matter that much. I know because I've heard new old stock tube. I I've been around the block, my friend. I've been playing for twenty years, and I am an amp guy first and foremost. The, uh, nothing excites me more than plugging into a different amplifier um, when, I, when I'm talking gear, right? Um, so there was a time period where I was plugging into pretty much anything I could get my hands on. And I haven't been that way in quite a number of years, but um, I can remember them telling me, you know, there were two deluxes at a, at a certain Chicago store. Um, and this one has original tubes. This one has current tubes. And I swapped cables and I went, geez, what's the fuck the difference? Because they were both basically the same era. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, I guess. Um, so I just want to put that out there. Uh, I don't believe in that, that very dust trickery. So when somebody tells right. you, we, we hand select <laughs> our tubes, fine. Who cares? I'm not worried about your hand selected tubes. Um, I, I'm, I'm totally fine with, a computer selecting my tubes because that's what Mesa Boogie does. And their second, their testing process is state of the art. They have like the last tube testing computer in the country. Um, it, it, their machine is, is, was an investment for that company. And, uh, they are still the best ones doing it based on everybody I've talked to in the industry. However, their tubes may not sound good in your amp because your amp may be designed for a shitty tube. And that happens. Um, companies design their amps around the kind of tube they're going to put in it. And sometimes they want a tube that's out of spec and doesn't run quite right. I know that sounds insane, but there is a thought process to that. And that's where you get into that hand selection process. But um, I don't, I just don't prescribe that. A tube is a tube is a tube, right? Now you can get into the different ratings, 1287, 12AX7, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a whole other ball of wax. Um, and of course, the longevity concerns, and that's another thing. And I've had people do that shit too with me. With like, I use or I have EL thirty fours, and then I have EL thirty four wing seats, and I have EL thirty four you know Mullards or whatever sitting here. And like, I had a guy actually sit there with me and go between EL thirty fours and six L sixes in the same amp, and I couldn't tell the difference. And I mean, it was cranked, and it was a four by twelve, two heads. Same, you know, two two different cabinets, but they're the same cabinet, and I'm gone, dude. You're smoking dope. Like, there's literally no difference between. Us. Um, and and I know that's not what everybody wants to hear, but people are people make this stuff out to be a lot bigger than it is. 
So from my from my perspective, what's likely to happen, we're going to see a lot of mom and pops go to business because they're not going to be able to get tubes. They're going to be competing with Fender. They're going to be competing with now Mesa Boogie as Gibson. And they're going to be competing with Marsh to get tubes. And they're going to be competing with, you know, the other big boys in the industry right now. So like maybe boutique amp distribution sol- sol- uh, soldiers on, you know, making Friedman and, and uh, Morgan and stuff. But the smaller companies like Rev, I don't know. The, the smaller companies like uh, Car, I don't know. Dr. Z, he's buying Russian surplus tubes. What's he going to do now? Because, you know, he's not buying the stuff that the EHX sells. He's buying stuff that, like, he's got a guy that brings them to him kind of deal. Um, you know, and I think you're going to see some of these com- these companies, if they don't have major buying power behind them, bold. Because they don't have any other product they can build. The guy that makes... um. Oh. I think some of them are starting to get into some solid state stuff. I think the guy that makes Milkman also makes a preamp. But like, that's, I mean, if you can't do that, if you can't make that transition from making tube amps to making something solid state or um, digital, <coughs> you're toast. It's over. You might, as well, might as well close your doors now because I don't understand how you're going to be able to compete. I mean, we're talking about Fender, like in order to keep up production, has been sourcing tubes from sources they would never buy from. Um, right. And uh, and they're ramping production back. Yeah. Well, we don't know how long that's going to last now because uh, right. by April it sounds like they're going to have a steady supply again. But um, we'll see. Yeah, there was a whole bunch of shenanigans with that too, and I don't know if everybody was aware, but I heard um, from a friend of a friend that was another podcast where a famous um, amp builder Fuchs, right? Um, I forget what his first name is Andy Fuchs. He was on uh, he was on a podcast and he was just railing because he's like, yeah, he's like. Tubes are gone, but they they had like an order for two hundred fifty thousand, and they had our money. So like, what the, like what the fuck happened to our money? Oh, you you're talking about EHX? Yeah, that's probably why that's they had to do it. Probably why and they it might went be... and bought bought them off with too. They had two hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a possibility, and and of course I'm just putting this out there that may they might fulfill the orders they've got, and and that might be it, and that might be it again. Yeah. We don't know. Just think about it. We don't know what the future holds. We do not know what's going on. We don't know what's going to come later. So those are things that. That's why, that's why I said, like, this is going to be an apocalypse. We're going to be talking yeah. this on the show a lot. I, it's funny that we did two special episodes because the news right. last week was horrible. And this week it's slightly better, but it's like. <laughs> yeah, me, but is to it my really? Way, to my way of thinking, it's not. It's the same as yeah. it was. I, I'm reminded of people telling me, hey, the price of gas went down. Yeah, and I saved 16 cents on my barbecue last year. Don't hand me that line of shit. So I, I just saved $2 on a, a $100 gallon, or, or I mean a $100 tank of gas. I mean, it, it, let's put it in perspective, folks. That's all I'm saying is just because EHX says that they're going to get some more stuff, they haven't, number one, hasn't finished yet. The deal is not done. That's number one. And number two, even if they get it, how long is it going to last? And that's, and three, they said the prices are going to substantially increase. What is that substantial increase going to be? And how long is that going to be able to be sustainable? Because uh, we go back to this mono price. We go back to this thing about people buying guitar tubes because they're, you know, they're, they're, do- the price is going to become to where an inexpensive tube amp is going to be 500 bucks, 600 bucks instead of, the 200 that it is now that i mean i'm just saying and it's not just because of the tube you're going to have more things go up and that's the thing that people forget the magnets and the and the stuff that makes magnets is going up pickups are going to go up because the stuff that makes the wire and the magnets a lot go, of minerals is going and up materials are going up because we're <clears> sourcing that from right. countries that are you know and, and if you don't all. believe me try to buy a ford right now which, yeah. by the way, Ford is actually getting rid of even more vehicles. They're shutting down more SKUs. Ford is going to where I can't remember if they're doing the, just the F-150 and I think the truck line and two cars. And that's it. Or it's one car. I mean, um, other than maybe the Shelby, which is which is the same line. I think they're going to do the, the Mustang and the others. And, of course, they're coming out with the one you're talking about. Well, the, there's the a bunch of cars that are still available from them. I, I think that's a bit no, of I a, a lot of talking about report. No, 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 that that they're not going to make anymore. So they're bringing this back. Maybe for this year. 
Um, and same with Toyota, same with a lot of them. That's because um, of the semiconductor crisis. Yeah. And the semiconductor crisis is really governing this year because they know that yep. next year there's going to be more chips available. So I would right. I would take whatever you're hearing with a pinch of salt on on them completely killing off SKUs. They're going to have more than two well, they, cars. That's just yeah, they, well they shut down they shut down the plant. Yeah, the, for this year, plants. correct, because they can't yeah. build anything. And they, right, right. But what I'm saying is, we don't know how long that's going to last. Yeah. Will it be a year? Will it be next year? We I, don't know. Well, they were they that's, were telling their investors next year. So yeah. Um, and, well, they'll and tell their investors whatever it takes to keep getting them investment money. I'm well, I, and that's subject to change. Obviously, everybody knows that. Exactly. I mean, that's it, yeah. it's just basically saying like we anticipate we're going to get this next year, but um, nobody that's knows. Right. I mean, coronavirus could take off in China again, and you know we have no semiconductors because unfortunately we're not smart enough to make stuff here anymore. We had three years to figure this out, and we're just now starting to wrap our head around the fact that you're still buying stuff from countries that aren't necessarily friendly with you. Um, right. So anyway. Uh, let's let's skip over to the uh, the final section. I I usually have a gig report, Jim, but this week we have uh, because of uh, because of our earlier conversation, we have the the, uh, the new the new aptly titled uh, segment called um, Gibson Report. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the Gibson so, Report. <laughs> I got to these all these off. Hang on. All right, can I can I kick it off? Since uh, yeah, absolutely. Because uh, my you're, thing, you're a Gibson guy, yeah, for sure. I want to hear your hot take on this. All right, so um, this week, or actually last week, but um, we're recording this Thursday the twentieth. Um, or I'm sorry, Sunday the twentieth. Um, and uh, last week, Gibson announced the Theodore. Okay, and um, I. Not, it didn't surprise me that Trogli not only had one, but had already bought one because somebody boo-booed and sold it to him before it was supposed to even be released. And Gibson said, hey, don't release that video because we haven't even announced it yet. <clears throat> but anyway, so he had to hold his video it's for a so day. so exciting. So exciting. This has got to be one of the ugliest, most most ridiculous things. This... Okay, so what happened was they found a piece of paperwork that, that was a design that Theodore Ted McCarty had put away, um, and somebody discovered it. Now, Ted McCarty had put this thing away, and it looks like, you know, honestly, Ted McCarty, I think, was an engineer of some kind. I know he was a business guy, but I also think he, I think he was some kind of engineer. Anyway, this, this drawing is terrible. It looks like he was he just like noodling. He designed countless Gibson guitars, Jim. Right. He was, right. A, he That's was what the I'm guy saying. that was responsible for like Les the Paul, Flying the V and the Explorer. SP. Right. I don't right. think he was so, involved with the design of the, the Les Paul as much, but but all the guitars well, post that. I, I think it depends on who yeah, it depends on who you listen to. But the yeah. point is um that because Les Paul will say that he had nothing to do with it and Ted says he's got a lot to do with it, so we'll we'll split the difference on that one. But anyway, so <clears throat> the point is, he designed all these guitars. I highly doubt that he designed this thing like to actually go out because there, there were a lot of things they didn't do in that fall that would have followed the design if they had gone with the the drawing that he made. So Gibson decided in their ultimate wisdom because they've got to they've got to release five thousand dollar guitars. This is the this is the thing that kills me. So it's a five thousand dollar custom shop. Turd. It's a. It's pretty much a um, a misshapen Les Paul Junior. with a Explorer headstock. Okay, that's what this is. It it has dot inlays. It's not bound. It's it, it's like fifties Telly style in its body makeup. Um, uh, it's got um, I. I Honestly, it's got a, it looks like a, a, a hockey stick with a broom on the other end is what it looks like. It's like somebody who loves hockey also bought a broom and, and it looks terrible. And the thing that I, I would get to is I wonder if Ted McCarty's ghost is going, no, I meant to burn that. I mean, it's like and and I get to where I sometimes tell my kids just because you can doesn't mean you should. But and this is obviously Gibson's freaking um, what do they call it when somebody does it just for money up uh, uh, money grab? 
This is obviously Gibson's money grab. $5,000 custom shop guitar. All you get is a cardboard thing replica of his thing and a, and a COA like you do with most custom shops. You get a nice case. Really is a nice case. Um, and you get a premium then you get leather this, strap, Jim. You get a premium yeah, and leather a premium strap. leather strap. Let's not forget yeah, that. That's yeah. true. Yeah. But I'll tell you something about having a custom, which is not hanging behind me right now because it's um, it's in its case. But uh, it's it's funny because when you get a custom, you know what the one thing they don't give you that they give you with the standards and even most of the um, studios, the god dang trust rod tool. <laughs> you don't get one. I don't know why. I guess they figure you're just gonna freaking look at it and go, oh. Look at this guitar. So the point is, and I'll I'll give it to you next. Five thousand dollars, three colors, sixty of each. Sixty of each, or one hundred eighty of each, no, something like that. Three hundred and eighteen guitars total. Three hundred. Uh, so it's three hundred and six. That's what the number is. Three hundred and six of each. Um. So all he did was say, okay, there's most of these people that are target audience for this like the Troglies of the world, are going to buy all three. They're going to be le- like the Pokemon uh, collect them all uh, guys that have to have all three colors. Because really, beyond that, it's a P90 freaking Les Paul Jr. You can get Fender USA for like 1200 bucks or 1100 bucks. It's a it's a $1,300 guitar, $100 guitar. That's what it is. And it's, and it's a shame. I Shame on you, Gibson. Shame on you for this one. This is garbage, and that comes from a guy who loves Gibson. Garbage. All right, this is a teardrop with horns, devil yep. horns, yep. Um, or or as I like to call it, airplane ears. They yep. kind of go out flattened at the top. Yep. Uh, it has the classic Explorer headstock. Now, before I go on, I want to stop for a second. Jim, it was incredibly hard for me not to just like jump in the middle of what you were saying and just be like, "This fucking thing sucks." Um, it, does. it is. I mean, honestly, this is a failure of epic proportions. Um, because you know people are going to look at this and go, "So I thought I thought they were introducing it as a regular model, but I, I of course Me found too. out they're doing a custom shop. Regular model doesn't make sense for this either. This is this is bad. Yeah. I can tell you what this is. So they're paying attention to the industry and they're watching what people are doing over at the offenders company GNL. GNL has his workshop right. and they preserved it. And they've been going through old drawings and sort of like fleshing out some of the ideas he had to produce actual instruments that never showed up. And they're not marketed right. to be anything but like this is a um, a Fullerton workshop guitar. In other words, this is one that, you know, he was thinking about and like was kind of indicating with his pickup designs and stuff while he was uh, still working there, but not one that he necessarily ever was planned to be produced in any way, shape or form. So, um, no, commensurate with that, let's, let's talk about this for a minute, because that's exactly what this is. They're, they're raiding Ted McCarty's old personal belongings. They're probably in storage somewhere, right? Some sort of archival thing. And they're going through yep. and they find this sketch and they go, hey, we could do what GNL does and we could produce this in a small run. This guitar was never going to see the light of day. Uh, it, this design, it's putrid. It's like vomit. Um, the only guitars that I can think of that are bigger fails for Gibson were the map and the uh, the reverse flying V. That was the, the those two guitars were the worst other things I've ever seen Gibson do. Um, but this is this is on par with that. Like it's not good looking. It doesn't appeal. I it doesn't appeal at all. I mean, I'm sure there are no. people that say like, well, it appeals to me. Fine. It's just like a, it's just like a mono price two amp. But here's um, the thing. Those people that say it appeals to me also say, but not for $5,000. Right, because th- that was just going to get at that. The people that would buy I've this very... are people that buy you know, $400 Squires. They don't buy $5,000 Gibson. Yeah, I've got a very close friend who I played with in, in New York who um, said to me straight up, he said, Jim, it's, it would be cool if it was like $1,000 or whatever. But I disagree. I can't remember the exact number. But he was like, if it was Gibson USA and was to, you know a, a, an inexpensive guitar, he goes, but this is not custom shop collector's model stuff. And uh, you know, and that's the thing. You you've already got not you personally. Gibson already has the um what's the one the Melody Maker, 
and they've already got the 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 Les Paul special, and you've got the um the uh, or not Les Paul yeah the the special, and you've got the um the SG special. All three of these already fit the bill that this thing is. It it would never sell as a regular Gibson USA model. It just wouldn't sell. It's ugly and it's and it's it, it doesn't it does what, what niche? Can, what niche? Can, can, can I take a minute to like explain something? They, did you see the promotional video they put out for this guitar? Literally the first half of the promotional yep. video is explaining what this is. Because yep. they have to explain it. Because otherwise there's no market for it. Which means that this is not a guitar that was ever designed to be really sold. This is a collector site, is what this is. And it's yeah. a very expensive collector site. And in my opinion, it's worthless to us as players. Somebody like Trogley will love this thing. He can throw it up and, sit and put it in his museum. And people can I say, go, look, wow, I've got, got one. one of those. Yeah. Big fucking deal. They're so right? rare. I've got one. It, it, truthfully, if this guitar was supposed to exist, Ted McCarty would have had it built. That, that, that's, what I want, that's what I want to point out here. Ted McCarty would have had this built. That's right. I mean, that's, that, this is a turd. He he built the things that he thought would sell. Uh, actually, yeah. wasn't the poly modern the one uh, the one from that line that they never actually produced that people have argued about and said that, that the poly modern uh, and don't forget let's 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 not forget the one that that they kind of don't talk about much which is the modern because you had the V and the Explorer but you don't see your people running around I mean some people get the modern. But for the most part, the modern was is it, something that wasn't, they, the, wasn't the modern. It, it is the poly modern, right? Because I know I think they reissued yeah. that as the poly modern, but it's, it's right. the modern. I thought yeah. I remember reading that like there weren't actually any moderns produced. That like all of the ones that made it out of the wild were prototypes. Right. And, uh, I thought I remember seeing that too. There was only like a few, but people, and they were but prototypes. people argue they went into production. Like they actually had production models. They did not. That that is according to I Gibson's records, so. they didn't. They never did production models. From from my understanding. <laughs> Now, I could be wrong on that. I'm sure probably could tell us, but um, I don't care. Like, this is this is horrid bullshit. It shouldn't exist. And quite frankly, the fact that we're having to devote time on an episode to talk about it, that pisses me off. Because oh. <laughs> cause, like, this is... This, look, we, we were talking about Gibson earlier in this episode. This is the problem I have with Gibson and Marshall, right? Fender's doing this to an extent. But Fender hasn't gone deep enough down the road of converting over to lifestyle products to make this a reality. But both Gibson and Marshall have done this thing where they're selling lifestyle products and they're selling collector's items, right? Marshall, not so much the collector's items, I think. But right. Gibson, th th that's what this is. This is for it people is. that have too much money. That, yep. That's exactly what this thing is. And yep. this, is, this is an attempt for Gibson to be like, okay, let me, <clears throat> let me show you something. By the way, you were correct. They never did run that into production back then. Um, it was... Uh... No, it was so poorly received at Nam, they scrapped producing. It's it's ironic. I have this pin, right? I, yep. It's ironic to me because I had, see to, that again? I had to dust it off. Yep. Um, I support the new Gibson. Where'd you get Where'd you get that? In Nam or uh, not Nam? Uh, oh, at the uh, Seawater um, Cure Fest. Yeah. But let me point something out. And I and I actually pulled this aside. This was in one of my bins I saw it the other day. I did support the new <coughs> Gibson, but I don't see any changes. I haven't seen any business practice changes from the company. And I know no. people are like, "Quality's better. Your setups are better. Your quality's not better. Your setups are better." I, I if you want to get your quality better, I want to see things that you don't offer at price points that you should offer. It. Like I don't. I shouldn't have to pay. Four thousand dollars to get an accurate replica of fifty nine. That's horseshit. Um, I shouldn't have to pay uh, three thousand dollars to get an accurate replica of a fifty nine. Because let's face it, we all know those guitars came out of the factory rough. We know they were hand shaped. Stop yep. pretending like you can't emulate that on the machine. Um, and 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 start putting them out. We want to see them. That's where the money should be, right? But here we still get this. Let's do 50 fucking slash signature model bullshit. I don't care about the slash signature model. Most guitar players don't care about the slash signature model. 
Do you know who does yep. care about the slash signature model? Electors. Slash. Do you know who else cares? Oh, about? Yeah. Do you know who else cares about slash signature model people? It, people in their 50s and 60s who don't really play guitar, but they have a lot of money. That's that's why I'm like, this is bonkers. We need to stop this kind of crap and start producing guitars for players. I know that they think this collector's market's going to last forever, but if you look at the income level for age groups and where it's going to be in 20 years, there's predictive models for this. We, uh, my age group does not have the money to collect guitars. We don't. And we won't. You can see it in the charts. It's reflected. It's right there in black and white. Because there are more people in my age group, and there's fewer money to go around. So how is that going to work? What are you going to do when we can't afford a $3,000 production guitar, let alone a $5,000 Theodore? This is just dumb. Yeah. It's not a sustainable business practice. <clears throat> no, but that, that's why they smartly put it at 306 or 318, sorry, uh, 106 of each, because they know that there's 106 morons. I say morons. I'm sorry. 106 collectors who will enjoy having these in the collection. And I say morons because I, I'm doing this in a, in a lighthearted way. In other words, I, I, God bless you, as we well, say in the South. <laughs> my, my, God pro bless my, my problem with the new Gibson is that this practice isn't limited to the Theodore. No, How it's many not. runs it's not. of Adam Jones Les Pauls are we going to get? Yeah, we got three so far. How many? Because it's going and... to be more. Oh, there's one more. It's called Gibson USA. That's coming. And we've had the, and there's guys that I, I don't know, maybe I'm not, it's because I'm not a huge Alice in Chains fans, but I think there's two acoustics that are, um, uh, what's his face? Jerry Cantrell. Um, yeah. And I'm like, was he that famous for playing acoustic? That yeah. That you would want two that signatures? Un Unplugged Special was a huge album. Huge. I thought so. I I know that the MTV Unplugged era was that. Time it might have been. So it might have been their biggest play. album, actually. Yeah. Um, I would, and, wouldn't shock. But me. I wasn't a big fan, so I'm I'm actually. That's why I went. Well, there's two of Jerry Cantrell acoustics, and they, but but honestly, they're not super high cost acoustics, and it kind of I don't know. It kind of makes me laugh because, but it makes me sad. I, I'm going to consider myself lucky. I'm just going to say this. I consider myself lucky. I've got four Les Pauls and I love all four of them. I've got one other Gibson. That's my 335. I'll, and I love that one. I love the way they sound. I love the way they play. And they're going to be in, you know, they're, they're part of my, a they're, part of me. Their current Les Paul what? lineup. I mean, with the standards being like $2,600, $2,700. It's not terrible. It's not horrible. But it's still out of the range of affordability for most folks. But, I think two thousand even would be like that makes sense. I okay, and, and I agree, I agree. But I want to say this: we talked when we started this channel relatively not long ago. We talked about the price gap between the Les Paul standard and the Fender Stratocaster. That's right there now. No, it's not. The Fender. No, the not. Fender. There's over a um, thousand. High end, there's over a thousand dollars difference. No, I'm, I'm talking about the the high end Fender. Um, Fender USA, I guess you call it. That's not what is we now compared, over though. well over two grand. That's not what we compared though. What we said was the standard Strat at that time, and there was a thousand dollar price gap. Actually, it was more than that at that time. I believe it was seventeen hundred. Now there's a thousand dollar price gap. Yeah, but the the. But, okay, the Les Paul standard is the high end Les Paul, which kind of kind of decries. No, it's the, not. No, it's not. It the is. custom is the high end Les Paul. Les well, Paul that's standard the, is then the standard. you're talking about. Then you're talking about custom shop. If you go to the custom, that's custom shop, and and then you're in custom shop Les. Or, no, no, uh, no. I, I'm I'm just saying center territory. I'm just saying that is not their high end Les Paul. They had the Les Paul Supreme at that time too. By the way. They, they just because they're not doing one now doesn't mean that that's the yeah, high end. The high end is the custom shop that that Les Paul custom that which is a four thousand dollar guitar. It's not a regular custom shop guitar like like buying a VOS or something. It's it's well, I don't a know production I, I level guitar made in the one, custom but... shop. Well, yeah, because you own one. Of course, you're going to beg to differ. Well, no, I'm just saying that I beg to differ only because the the um the custom shop or the the Les Paul custom is just a blinged out. Les Paul. 
standard. What do you think a, a high end Strat is? Well, no, the the Ultra. <laughs> Tim, you're talking the Ultra <laughs> is their is their flagship, right? Then you go to the stuff that's beyond the Ultra, right? And, and it doesn't know. even have to go. I don't even see the Ultra. I don't even see the standard as being the Gibson's flagship. That's that's why I'm I that's do. why I'm pointing out. Like I don't even see that as being the case. That's like a standard guitar for them. I mean, so like I the do. modern, right? Which is three grand, is the Ultra. Okay, that is what that is. That is their version of you know that that level of guitar. So those are the two you should compare. Like, if you're going to tell me that, that okay. there's only a $600 price modern. difference, that's just not, that's not realistic. I could live with the modern. I could, I could say that, that, uh, and I could, I would live with comparing the modern. And that's $3,000. So you're talking, you're still talking a thousand dollar price gap. Yeah. They're still at $3,000. That's not bad. I mean, it's, um, it's better than it was. But it's, yeah. I still think that's it's, and it's less money than the standard was when we were talking about it at that time. Cause the Les Paul standard back before, because that was before the Geskowitz left, was at $3,200. Well, so, so here's my, here's, here's my, my backup take on that. We really need to get out of here. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to believe it. Yeah. Much. yeah. This is a topic we can talk about in another episode at some point. But yeah. Um, well, actually, it's probably worth revisiting the, the price gap and what you get for your money. Cause actually, that's what I want to sort of bring up is the fact that, Look, I'm not going to pretend like a Les Paul standard is supposed to be the same thing as a Strat. Like a Strat's a cookie cutter guitar. It's built out of parts. Yep. Um, yep. It doesn't yep. have, you know, it doesn't have modern accoutrements like the standard Strat, which is what now like the professional series or whatever, whatever basic professional model they have. Um, that that guitar is not supposed to be a Les Paul, right? Like it's a, it's a different thing. And I don't think they should be the same price point. I, I actually right. think that a thousand dollar difference is reasonable but the mm -hmm. problem is the things you actually want from gibson are like a lot yeah, of know. money they're not that it, you're right you're, you you're absolutely it. correct i will i would never argue that i i agree with you wholeheartedly so i think it's too much money well well like like let me point this out right so les paul jr 16 and 16 dollars for single pickup guitar it doesn't even have an adjustable tailpiece i know what I the know. fuck i mean and then a les paul special 1700 dollars guitar which is basically Les Paul Jr. with a second pickup. Yep. It and is. It, and it's seventeen hundred dollars. Like that's yep. you guys are nuts. That's not a seventeen hundred dollar yep. guitar. That should be a twelve hundred dollar guitar at best. Yeah, yeah. Best. And if you're gonna tell me, oh well they're higher quality, well I'm gonna tell you the difference in quality there, uh, it's negligible. Going for because no. for, no. I can I can pour, I can shake a stick at a lot of thirteen hundred dollar guitars. They're just that as good as a Les Paul specialist. I they could never understand. Yeah, I could never understand somebody who buys a Les Paul Special over a Telecaster, right? Because I mean, honestly, honestly, just get a Telecaster, put P nineties in it, put P ninety in it. You're done. To say, I mean, it's literally the same thing. The only difference is the the scale length. That's right. Um, the bolt on neck. That's really. The I mean, only I, and and if you yeah, if you believe the bolt on neck is like a, a thing right. like, that you don't like, but I, the, I challenge people like most of the time. They they put way bigger emphasis on that than they should. That's right. That's right. You're you're absolutely right. Honestly, <clears throat> you know that is a, the 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 special is the Telecaster of the Gibson world. I mean, come on. I mean, well, I mean, even this, I could I could even say like the SG. If you go and look at the SGs, um, yeah, that's that's kind of more akin to a Telecaster in a lot of ways. And those things are overpriced right now. Come on. I was just going to say, though, that's if you really want to talk about guitars that are like way out of the realm of affordability, um, I cannot the understand. The only desirable SG in the line for me is like two grand. Two grand. And up. And up. And it's just not realistic. So I can have a small guard. Come on, guys. We know these guitars aren't expensive to produce. That's why you changed them to begin with. Like, that's, that, that's just, this is like premium money. Um, and, uh, I, that's really, really been my issue with them is like, okay, so now we've raised quality level, but how much do you think quality is worth? A lot of the quote unquote quality problems could have been fixed with a setup anyway. So it's like, you know, and the fact of the matter is people are still talking about tooling. They're still talking about, look, I don't, all care. The I don't care about that. that. That's the, I mean, I brought it up on the show, but really, yeah. realistically, like that stuff I can live with that. I can't, yeah. I can't live with the idea that I'm going to pay. So when I bought my SG. And it was less than five years ago. I paid a thousand dollars flat for it. Yep. And it was a it was a big guard, right? Like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna deny that. 
but yep. it's still like to get the similar model that's being made now i'd have to buy a, a, a standard 61 which is yep. two thousand dollars two thousand dollars you know remember when i bought that pelham blue sg mm-hmm. that i stupidly sold that pelham blue sg i paid eight hundred dollars yes i paid used price but eight hundred dollars not a penny more, not a penny less, 800 bucks. And that it, the, the price on that thing on those things right now is silly, stupid. I, I, and that's why I won't sell a guitar right now. I won't sell a guitar. You know why? I won't be able to afford it to buy it again. If, if I sell a guitar right now, it's going to be that because I will not play it again. The, the truth of the matter is that I'm not going back to that for that very reason. I just, uh, I mean, crazy flying V's and Explorers at nineteen hundred dollars. Oh, I mean, you guys, they, these are not they, these guitars are not harder to make. Why are these no. more money? Why are these more money? And that's the other thing is like the, the Les Paul. It's it's literally eight hundred dollars more than a than a you know a V. Yeah. Like, well, where's the eight hundred dollars of why? labor? But why the <laughs> the binding? I could see maybe a no. little bit more. Jim, it's not that. This is what I've been trying to tell you. It's the desirability factor. I want yeah. that guitar that everyone else played on that favorite record I had. And so therefore Try. now the, in, the intrinsic value is higher. And yeah. we, we, we've created this claim. Not we, but like the whole culture right, of guitar right. players. Because right. we just pay it. And it's so stupid. It's so silly. Like, um, and I think I, that's why I don't support the new Gibson right now. because. I think they're still based on the same principles, which is a collector's mentality that they haven't figured out that like it, this isn't about collecting for most players. This is about getting a guitar that they can actually use and go to a gig and beat the hell out of it and not care if it gets, you know, thrashed, break the headstock off and re-glue it. Like that's not, I mean, I'm sure there are people that still do that, but like, I just couldn't imagine spending two twenty eight hundred dollars on a Les Paul to beat the shit out of it. And that's not really the way that rock and roll was supposed to be done. So it's like, I'm not buying Gibson. And I know a lot of people I've talked to are like, they're not affordable. I'm not buying one. I, th- they'll buy an ultra. They'll buy a, a sir, even a used sir. Not, they won't buy a new one, but they'll right. buy like a used sir if they can get a deal on one, but they won't buy a Gibson because it's just like, it's a status symbol that is um, uh, of a bygone era when people had money and collected them. And it's, that's for me, like, I, it's not so much that I, I like Les Paul's, um, I wouldn't mind having one in my collection, but, uh, cause it would be nice to have the records and stuff, but I'm not going to pay. I mean, I got, I, I bought a PRS and it was cheaper, a USA PRS. And I think I got a better value for my money, even though I've had finish issues with it. Like yeah. that's, yeah. I honestly, yeah. That, what was that? $1,400? $1, uh, it's a special edition. I paid 1800 Okay. Well, I didn't pay, but it was in that ballpark. Yeah, it was it was priced that. Yeah, and, and again, I see that. Um, the we get back to what you know. I know we haven't released the Dylan talks tone episode yet, but what we talked about with Dylan, and that is that play what you like, play what you love, play what sounds good, play what feels good. The, you know, there's always this thing. We can talk about this going down the road, but there's always this thing. The most, the thing that you touch the most, the thing that that draws your eyes, the thing that you look at, the thing that you feel, the thing that you touch is the guitar. Because really, the money should go into the amp. We know that. We've talked about that a hundred times. The money should go into the amp. If you, if I had the money I had in guitars and an amp, I'd have some sound that that would be just destructive. <laughs> so don't spend five thousand. Don't spend five thousand dollars on a guitar. <gasps> That's right. Don't do that. That's right. That's bad. Go buy a go buy a good amp. All right, Jim. (laughs) It's time. I've been David. I've been Jim. And tonight we've been practical guitarists. Impractically. Whining.